Let me uh, welcome you if you're a guest to Christ Church Peoria. Int- introduce myself if you are a regular part of our church family. Uh, my name is uh, Adam, and I uh, attend our Central Phoenix congregation. I bring you greetings from Central Phoenix. I attend there alongside my wife, Casey, and uh, our three and a half year old son, Adam. And it's one of the greatest privileges of, m- of my life, along with the privilege of being a husband and a father. Uh, to serve as one of our pastors here at uh, Christ Church. And most of you I don't uh, know, haven't really had the chance to get to know or personally yet. I've met a few of you this morning, uh, but I want you to know I, I've known about you and prayed for you uh, many times over the years since even before you were a church. And that is directly connected to uh, the influence of your uh, lead pastor, Seth Kleberger, uh, in my life from a very, young ye- a very young age, very beginning of my walk uh, as a follower of Jesus. It was probably about 2011 or 2012 that uh, I came stumbling into the lobby of Harvest Bible Chapel, North Phoenix, and I was there because I was invited to a men's uh, Bible study uh, from a co-worker, and so I stumbled in at 6 a.m. on a Wednesday morning to this uh, men's Bible study where uh, Seth Kleberger was the worship pastor at the time, and he was leading worship that morning alongside another Seth, uh, Seth Beer, who's one of our pastors out in Gilbert now. And uh, they were leading worship that morning, and the study was going uh, through the book of Nehemiah. And they were doing what we do here every single weekend. They were opening up the Bible and teaching men line by line, verse by verse, paragraph by paragraph, uh, through the Bible. And it just so happened that the lead pastor was out of town that week, and so Seth was filling in for him. And the chapter of Nehemiah that we were in was uh, genealogy. And I don't know how you typically feel when you run across the genealogies in your Old Testament you got a whole bunch of listed names, most of them hard to pronounce, and you're not really quite sure how that genealogy sort of matches up to where you're at in your life, what you're walking through, what you're struggling with, what you're celebrating, and I wasn't really sure either, and having never really been exposed to uh, expositional, applicational preaching like we do here each and every single week, I really wasn't sure what to expect, uh, but that's exactly what Seth did. He opened the Bible, he read it, and he explained it. He did it in a way that was biblical and digestible and understandable, and then he applied it to real life. And from that moment, I was hooked. That moment, I was sold. I knew that that was the kind of church that I wanted to be in, and so I started uh, attending there. And not long after that, I put my my name in the hat to serve, and I wanted to serve uh, under Seth. I wanted to be part of the worship team. The problem with that is that I'm about as musical as a fence post, and my wife has likened my singing to the auditory equivalent of a biohazard. It's not very good. (laughs) And so I got put on the production team, and so I got to sit in the back, and I got to click the slides forward on Sunday morning, and that's where I served. But before I could serve, I had to have a meeting with the worship pastor. And so I went and met with Seth in his office, and I met with him for an hour while he grilled me on my testimony as a follower of Jesus and wanted to know why I wanted to serve, why I was there. But then he spent time and he walked me through what the Bible actually says about worship and about serving. And he told me at the end of the meeting that the reason that he did that is because he wanted there to be zero illusions in my mind about what it meant to serve as part of the team. He explained to me that every element of the production that we do on Sunday morning, from him playing up in the front and leading and singing all the way to me in the back, all of it was intended to be an act of worship to the one true God. That that's why we were there. That we weren't chasing the approval of people. That we weren't pursuing excellence for its own sake, but that what we were doing and everything that we were doing, our aim was to honor and to glorify God, whether that was by eliminating distractions, whether that was by playing well and singing well, so that we could facilitate the opportunity for our church family that was gathered together to lift high the name of Jesus and worship to be able to do exactly that. And what stood out to me about that meeting and what I could understand even as a very young man, even at that moment, is that Seth cared deeply not simply about having people to his team, having people on his team. It wasn't just about getting another person on the rotation and on the schedule for the week. Seth cared deeply, not simply that we served, but Seth cared how we served. And as we are in this series, Get Strong, and as we are talking about growing up as followers of Jesus into disciples who are strong in their faith, one of the means of grace that God has given to us to help us grow strong in our faith as followers of Jesus is the ability and is the opportunity that we have to serve. 
That if we're going to be followers of Jesus who stand strong in the face of trial and difficulty, if we have any desire or expectation that in a week from now or a month from now or a year from now that we will be farther along in our pursuit of Jesus and growing up uh, into all that God has called us to be as disciples of Jesus, it will be in part because we have leaned into the means of grace that God has established to accomplish that very purpose. And one of the primary means that he has given to us is his gift and the privilege of serving. But because of who our God is, because of his goodness, and because of his grace, and because of his loving kindness to us in Jesus, he cares about more than simply that we serve. And God doesn't need uh, people to serve. He doesn't need us at all, quite frankly. Um, The Bible says that God is not served by human hands as though he needed anything from any single one of us, because it is he who gives life and breath to all things everywhere. God is not uh, in need of more employees to fill the role each and every single week. The Bible says that his arm is not shortened, that it cannot save. God is a good father, and because he's a good father, he invites us to participate with him in the work that he is already doing to redeem people to himself. But because of his goodness and because of his kindness to us, he invites us to serve, and he invites us to serve for our benefit. And so because of that, he is deeply concerned not with that we serve so much as he is concerned with how we serve. So that's the big idea that's going to sit over top the passage that we'll study this morning, which will be in John chapter 13. And followers of Jesus grow spiritually strong by serving like Jesus. If we are going to grow up, if we are going to mature, if we are going to grow strong as disciples of Christ, it will be because we are serving, and we are serving after the pattern and the example that the Lord Jesus has given to us. And so we're going to be in John chapter 13, verses 1 through 17. I'm going to read it out loud, and you can follow along silently as I do. And remember, uh, these are God's words for us. Uh, Let's give them our full attention. John chapter 13, verse 1 says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the Devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, the one who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you, for he knew who was to betray him. That's why he said not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garment and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, then you also ought to wash one another's feet, for I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. And followers of Jesus, and those of us in this room who call him Savior and Lord, we will grow spiritually strong when we serve like Jesus. And so the question we're going to seek to ask and answer this morning is this. If serving like Jesus will help me to grow spiritually strong, then how do I do that? How do I serve like Jesus? And there are three ways that the Apostle John gives us here in the narrative of John chapter 13, verses 1 through 17, uh, that I think that we can see that will help us understand how we can serve uh, like Jesus. We'll take them one at a time. We'll do it like this. I serve like Jesus when I, number one, display God's humble love. Display God's humble love. Now, notice as we begin what John draws our attention to here. John doesn't simply give us the raw facts that Jesus got up from supper, put on the towel, started 
washing the disciples' feet, John actually goes a layer deeper. Uh, Through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we're actually uh, given insight into a deeper layer that we don't always get when we read the Scripture. Here, in these few verses, we actually are given the opportunity to peer into the heart of Jesus and into the heart of the disciples, namely Judas. And what we can see here is that what is motivating Jesus in his service is nothing short of divine, self-sacrificing, self-denying, humble love. So notice first, John says that when Jesus knew, so Jesus knows some things as he's serving, and he knows that his hour has come to depart out of the world to the Father, and here's how he feels about them in that moment. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And then he says, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, he knows that he possesses now all authority And that he had come from God and was going back to God. So Jesus knows his time is almost up. He knows the job is almost done. In only a matter of hours, he's going to be reunited in glory with the Father and with the Spirit. He is no longer going to be bound by the confines of his earthly humiliation. He's going to once again be seated in glory, receiving the honor and the praise and the majesty that he is due for his person and his work. And he's going home. And in these final moments, in these last few minutes that he has with his disciples, what is he doing? How is he spending that time? And we find him serving. We find him getting low. And the reason I think that that's particularly remarkable is because when we compare this moment with everything that has led up to this moment in Jesus' three-year earthly ministry, and giving all that he's endured in that time, I mean, think about for a moment. Think about the constant barrage of accusations regularly being thrown at him from the religious leaders. Think about the frequent misunderstandings of the people as they seek to one day make him a king and then the next day throw him off a hill. Think about the unending clamor of the sick and the hungry and the demon-possessed who all constantly want and need from him, all the way down to the level of the disciples who just keep hitting a wall. They can't understand. They misunderstand. They misconstrue. They're constantly characterized and paralyzed by fear and impetuousness. And I think maybe in this moment we would understand if Jesus was like, you know, I, I see like five minutes. Like, could I just like run to the local Walmart, leave the kids with mom for a few minutes and just like have a minute to myself? Parents have any idea what I'm talking about? Or he's the king of the universe, right? He knows all authority has been given to him. What he could do is he could make his subjects snap to it, right? I've been serving, I've been protecting, I've been providing, I've been feeding, and man, I'm almost out of here, time's almost up. Maybe I could kick my feet up and you all could just serve me for a change. But that's not our Lord. That's not what he does. Because the Son of Man came not to be served, right? But to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. In his final moments with his disciples, he's going to wring out the towel serving because he's loved his own, John tells us, and he's not going to stop. He's going to keep on loving them right up to the end. He knows he's going back to the Father, and he knows that all authority has been given into his hands. All authority in heaven and on earth is his. And what is he going to do with all of that authority? He could do anything. And he's going to use it to serve, humbly, lovingly. And he won't just serve the ones who are loyal to him, right? We know the story. We know how it goes. He uses it to serve one who he already knows is going to betray him, one whom he already knows has turned away from him in his heart. Jesus is going to use his authority. He's going to use his time to serve Judas. This is humble love. And humble love like this, humility like this, I think is a very difficult thing in our day. I think we sort of get a warm and fuzzy feeling here, right? We read this story, we see Jesus serve Judas like this. We like that he does it, but when it's our turn, I think it's easy for us to begin to find ways to excuse ourselves, to get ourselves out of it. And we say things like, well, that's Jesus, 
you know, and I'm not Jesus. He's perfect. I'm imperfect. You know, I'm trying to be like him, but I'm not quite like him. So and I think sometimes it's because we've been more discipled by our culture and our cultural moment than we have by Jesus and by the word of God. Because for some of us, I think the risk is that the moment that it's our turn to get down, the moment that it's our turn to get low and to serve those, especially those who hate us, especially those who disagree with us, especially those who don't like us or are antagonistic to us, the moment that it comes for us to be overlooked or disregarded or hated or maligned or spit out or insulted or persecuted. It's like a nerve is hit that's deeply rooted in pride and self-preservation and we become angry, we become antagonistic, we become irritated. And I think that it's incredibly prevalent right now in our country and the hour of this cultural moment. It feels nearly impossible sometimes to find even among followers of Jesus humility like this that would characterize us. John MacArthur has said, humble people today are mocked and trampled on. That's why we don't do it. We don't like to be mocked and trampled on. He says the world calls them wimps and instead exalts pride, arrogance, and runaway egos. See, far from the vice that the Bible pictures it to be, pride, along with its many variant forms, self-assertion, haughtiness, arrogance, uh, these aren't seen as vices, but these are seen as virtues. as something for us to emulate and copy from the music that's on our playlist to the entertainment that we take in to the politicians that we vote for to the people that we follow on social media we are daily being assaulted by a barrage from the world that is seeking to disciple us to be rich in pride and impoverished when it comes to humility but the scripture says woe to those who call evil good and good evil but when we as followers of Jesus, as followers of the King, when we behold Jesus and we recognize that we live in an upside down kingdom and that our strength and our ability to grow up into strong followers of Jesus, it doesn't come from asserting ourselves or asserting our rights because love isn't arrogant or rude, the scripture says. Love doesn't insist on its own way, but when we recognize that our power spiritually comes from serving like Jesus, then we will display humble love like this. And so the question is, when was the last time you did this? When was the last time I did this? When was the last time we got really low? When was the last time we humbled ourselves in love for another person, particularly somebody that we knew didn't like us, particularly somebody that we knew hated us, an enemy? And I'm not talking about laying down our convictions here. I mean, when was the last time you laid down your preferences, what you would rather do, maybe what you had the right to do in order to serve another person? When's the last time you did it for the people in closest proximity to you? See, the irony of this is sometimes the hardest people in our lives to do this with, they're not all the people out there that hate us and don't like us. Sometimes they're the people that live in our home. Sometimes it's the people that we sit next to at work or we go to school with. How often are we laying down our preferences to serve the people that God has put into our lives? How often are we sacrificing what we would rather do in order to influence those within our spheres? And do we do it when we do it? Is it characterized with joy? Is it characterized with love? Because 1 Corinthians 13 says that we can actually make all of these grand gestures of sacrifice, but if it isn't connected to love in our hearts, then it doesn't mean anything. The Apostle Paul says that the only thing that even counts is faith working through love. We've been trying to teach our son uh, this uh, as he's growing. He's three and a half right now. He's fully in the throes of toddlerism. And... um, We've been teaching him that obedience is all the way, right away, and with a happy heart, right? It's not just that you do it, though that's important. It's not just that you do it right away, though that's also important. It's that your attitude is joy. Your attitude is a happiness of heart because God actually commands that of us. That's how God's world works. God isn't just interested in our service. God is particularly interested with how we serve. Delight yourself in the Lord in the Psalms is not a suggestion, it's a command. God commands our emotions. And so he's, he's funny right now, oftentimes he will do the things that we ask him to do, but you know, he does it, I say like, hey buddy, like, get your pajam- stop playing, put your pajamas on, and he'll do it, but first he's got to do a little, mm, and then hit the bed, 
If the dog's nearby, try and kick the dog. And so we ask him, we say, are you really obeying? Are you really obeying daddy? If when I tell you to do something, you're doing it with an angry attitude. Why? Because uh, God cares not just how we do things, or not just that we do things, he cares how we do things. Scripture says God loves a cheerful giver, right? God cares not just that we serve how we serve. And if we are going to serve like Jesus and thereby grow strong spiritually, it will be because we do it with humble love. You know, God does this with you, right? God has never grumbled when he has served you. That's the reason we sing, right? When we're singing of God's protection, of his goodness and his grace, there's no thought in our minds whatsoever that God has done any of those things with a complaining, grumbling attitude. He's done it with joy. He's done it with love. If you are a follower of Jesus here this morning, and if you are a recipient of every one of the covenant blessings God has promised to his people, it's because you have been served by the one who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. And the Bible says, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And the writer of Hebrews says that he did that for the joy that was set before him. And so we also ought to do exactly what the Apostle Paul commands us to do in Philippians chapter 2. We need to have that mind among ourselves. We need to serve with joy, with humility, with love. And when we do, we will serve like Jesus. So we serve like Jesus when we display God's humble love Secondly, when we advance God's eternal purpose. So Jesus moves now to his explanation. And as he begins washing uh, Peter's feet, Peter almost immediately objects. He says, Lord, what are you doing? And this is likely because, as you've no doubt heard before, this was a task that was reserved for the lowest of the low servant in the household. And Peter, assuredly knowing this, almost immediately recoils. So, like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Why are you washing my feet? You're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus, uh, as John tells us, uh, helps Peter understand that there's more to what's happening here than merely on the physical level of getting dirt off of Peter's feet. That's why Jesus says, what I'm doing now, you don't understand, but you will understand later. There's really two things Jesus is doing here. First, and we'll deal with this in the next point, is He's setting an example for the disciples and for all of us. But then secondly, and what we're going to talk about right now, is Jesus is using the foot washing to point to a far greater cleansing that's needed. He's using the foot washing as a symbol to point to a greater washing of our souls that is needed. And in doing that, he is seeking to advance his purposes in the lives of his disciples. So notice, Peter says, you shall never wash my feet. And it's so often been the case with Jesus, he kind of seizes on the opportunity to use this to turn the conversation. Uh, He moves from the temporal to the eternal. He uses the physical to teach about the spiritual. He says, if I don't wash you, uh, you don't have any share with me. Jesus is always doing this, right? You have the feeding of the 5,000. He feeds all of these people with the bread. Only in John chapter 6, use it to try and teach them about the bread of life. Right, or Jesus is uh, with the woman at the well in John chapter 4, and he uses the imagery of, of water and buckets to teach about the water of life. Or in his miracles of physical healings, Jesus is constantly pointing to a greater healing that is needed and only that he can bring, a healing from the consequences of sin. And I wonder if you know somebody in your life that's like that. Every conversation, every interaction, it's not just what you thought it was, it always seems to take a turn. You thought you were talking about one thing, but it turns out you were actually talking about something deeper, more fundamental. And by God's grace, I'm trying to do this as best as I can as a dad. My my wife is really good at this, and I'm just sort of catching up. But these days, um, our little guy doesn't like when it gets dark. He knows that the daytime, he's free to run around and play and do all the things that he wants to do. And he starts to see the sun go down. I'll be, it's going down later these days, but he starts to see the sun going down. And uh, he knows that means bedtime is getting close. And so he always looks at me and he, he says in his cute little three-year-old voice, he says, he says, dad, why it's getting dark? He goes, I want it to be daytime. 
I said, well, it's the end of the day, buddy. And he goes, well, why? And we tell him, we say, well, God made the day for us to play and for us to work. And God made the nighttime for us to rest and for us to relax. And these are both really good gifts from God that we should thank him for. And what we're trying to do there is we're trying to help him understand there's more, to go, there's more going on here than what you see. That what you see behind the sunset or the sunrise, there's actually eternal spiritual realities here. And here in John chapter 13, there is more going on here than a simple dinnertime hygiene routine. This washing, and Jesus begins to explain, is symbolic. It points to a spiritual reality and eternal reality that there is a much deeper cleansing needed. See, Peter, the rest of the disciples, like all of us, are filthy. And that filthiness is more than skin deep. It touches the soul. It touches down to the very fabric of who we are at, our, at, at the core of our being, at the core of our identity. It's sin, the Bible says. And the Bible often uses this imagery of of filth to describe our condition of sin before the Lord. The image is of a soiled garment or a stained garment. The idea is that in our sin, we are so utterly repulsive and repugnant that we actually repel God. And like Peter and the rest of the disciples, we need cleansing. But also like Peter, sadly, left to ourselves, we reject Jesus' cleansing of our sin. Left to ourselves, we would seek to find every other alternative to try and make ourselves clean, to try and make ourselves right with God, except for the one provision that God has made to do precisely that. There is one mediator between God and man, and that is Jesus Christ, and he alone makes us clean by our faith in him and his substitutionary atonement on the cross in our place. And John Calvin, commenting on this verse, says, we are all filthy and abominable in the sight of God until Christ wash away our sins. See, the significance of this moment is not simply that the dirt needs to come off. It's that Jesus needs to be the one to do the cleansing. Because just like for us, it is not simply that we are dirty and impure and uh, defiled before God. We need the cleansing of God himself. We need the cleansing of Jesus upon us to make us right before God. And only when we turn away from our efforts to get right with God and we place our confidence in Jesus and in Jesus alone can we receive the cleansing that we so desperately need. And that is what Jesus is pointing them to here. Jesus is pointing them to the good news of the gospel. He's advancing his purposes in their lives that are more significant than what's happening temporally. He's pointing to their greatest need eternally. And so for us, if there is any hope, if there is any prospect that we would grow strong spiritually by serving like Jesus, it will be because like Jesus in our serving that we would seek to advance the message and the mission of the gospel, that we would seek to advance God's eternal purposes in the lives of those that we are serving. And so when you serve, do you do so for the privilege and the opportunity of pointing beyond yourself to the one who by laying down his life to make undeserving, filthy, God-hating sinners like you and me clean has committed the ultimate act of service? Uh, This is one of the things I love about City Hope. I love City Hope. Uh, Serving there is probably one of the best kind of pre-programmed opportunities where you can do this. And you know if you've ever been to City Hope or if you've ever served there before that we are explicit and we are upfront that our goal, our purpose in meeting physical needs is so that we can point beyond the physical to the spiritual. We want to point beyond the level of physical needs to tell people about their greatest need, which is for Jesus. Like Jesus, we seek to serve the hungry with physical food in order to meet that need, but order that we could point beyond to the one who is the only one who satisfies hungry souls. We seek to provide bread so that we can talk about the bread of life, the one who alone can give lasting hope and joy and peace and life to those who are desperate and destitute. We seek to provide clothing in order that people wouldn't be left cold in the winter or exposed to the sun's rays in the summer, but also so that we can point beyond the physical covering to the spiritual covering that's provided when we place our faith and our trust in Jesus, who then clothes us with the perfect spotless righteousness of Christ. We distribute Bibles and we pray with the desperate and the destitute and the lonely and we invite them to church and we listen to their story because we want them to know that there is a God who exists, who has created them, who loves them, who has created them in his image and for his glory and hasn't forgotten them and hasn't overlooked them, but in Christ has taught to display his love by providing the solution and the remedy to their greatest need which is to be reconciled to God who alone can free them from addiction, who alone can satisfy their souls, who alone can give them hope. We even lovingly seek to confront the 
violent and the rebellious so that they know that there is a king who is ruling and who is reigning and who is daily expanding his rule and his reign and his authority as the gospel takes more and more ground in hearts and lives. And we seek to call them to humble themselves, to turn from their sin and from their rebellion to repentance and to believe in Jesus before it's too late. We plead with them to find refuge in Christ from the wrath that is to come for all who refuse and reject him. And we seek in serving, not merely to address the physical needs of the moment, but like Jesus, to advance God's eternal purposes in their lives. And so the question is, in your serving, what are you aiming at? What are you hoping to accomplish? What is your ultimate goal? Listen, that you are serving is fantastic. Whether that's here on a Sunday morning in the kids' wing, or out in the lobby, or out in the parking lot, or whether your serving is of your family or people in your neighborhood or people in your community, all of those things are great things. But if we are going to grow spiritually strong, it will be because in all of our serving, we are seeking to serve like Jesus and point beyond what's happening on the horizontal level. We point beyond to the eternal purposes and the lives of those we seek to serve and thereby seek to advance the mission of the gospel. And all we do, are we seeking first his kingdom and his glory? Because spiritual strength grows when we serve like Jesus serves. First, when we do it with humble love. Secondly, when we do it to advance God's eternal purposes. And finally, when we do it following God's humble example. So Jesus wraps up the foot washing. He resumes his place at the dinner table. And he says to his disciples, he says, You call me teacher and Lord. And that is exactly right. That's who I am. And if I, as your teacher and as your Lord, have washed your feet, then you also ought to wash one another's feet. And his point is simple and straightforward. If I, the one that you recognize as your master and as your king, as your Lord, if I have washed your feet, if I have served you, then who are you to refuse to serve anyone? I mean, the staggering reality of what has happened in Jesus' condescension in order to serve us by taking on human flesh in order that he should die in our place should humble us. When we, we, we consider together, just consider for a few moments who the Bible tells us Jesus is. Consider all that the Bible says about Jesus as the second person of the Trinity and then contrast that with what he's done for you and me. The Bible tells us that this Jesus, the one that we read about here in John chapter 13, he is no mere man. He is not simply a good example or a good moral teacher. He is divine. He is the second person of the Trinity. He is God of very gods, eternally existing in perfect unity with the Father and the Spirit in eternal, matchless glory and splendor and beauty and majesty and excellence. He is the recipient of unceasing, eternal, angelic praise as the Father's perfect imaging forth of himself. The Bible says that this Jesus, he is the eternal word through whom God creates the universe by simply speaking a word and then from nothing in an instant appears everything and it stands fast ready to obey every word of his command and who even right now the Bible says is upholding the universe in this room by the word of his power because he's that powerful. He is the source and the purpose for all that exists. He is the one for whom and by whom all things exist and were created from every image-bearing man or woman that has ever been conceived, regardless of if they have ever lived outside the womb or not, all the way down to the single-celled organisms upon which these very image-bearers depend for their existence. The one whose creative splendor and beauty and sheer awesomeness can be seen in lush mountains and forests and rivers and oceans, all teeming with life innumerable, whose power is strong enough to bring forth massive, glorious mountain ranges and peaks like Mount Everest, which is 29,000 feet high in the sky, all the way down to Challenger Deep in the Mariana Trench, 36,000 feet deep. He's the one whose limitless glory and power is but hinted at when we consider vast stars and galaxy billions of miles away and black holes with masses something like 40 billion times that of our sun down to each and every molecule and subatomic reality in this room and upon which we depend for our very life and all of it a mere shadow in comparison to the substance of who he is and only existing 
infinitely to testify to the superior, powerful, and fearsome reality that is him. The Bible says that this Jesus here in John chapter 13 is the one who possesses all authority. This is the one before whom all creation kneels and bows and submits, or if not today, will one day kneel and bow and submit. And if they refuse to do so willingly and joyfully, in the words of R.C. Sproul, will have their knees broken with a rod of iron. This is the singularly eternal one who alone is uncreated, non-contingent, who possesses life in himself, who alone has immortality and who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or ever can see. This is the eternal glorious one of such purity and brightness and glory and majesty and power from whom earth and sky will one day flee away as there will be found no place for them before the face of him who is holy, the one whom before the scriptures say even the heavens are not pure in his sight. This is Jesus and he is no mere man. He is the king of the universe. And as we read earlier, he has humbled himself. And listen, he has humbled himself not simply to take on human flesh and be made to look like us. Because Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.21 that in his condescension, Jesus became identified with the very filth that he has sought to remove from our souls. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that for our sake, God made Jesus to be sin though he knew no sin. In his condescension, Jesus has become the lowest of the low. And why? Because, Paul says, in order that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus has become the lowest of the low. He has assumed the lowest possible position in order to serve and exalt hell-bound haters of God like you and me. And in so doing, he has set an example for us so that we would follow in his steps. No place that you or I could ever stoop to serve would ever be so low as the lowest place that Jesus has humbled himself to in order to serve us. And so who do we think ourselves to be if we think ourselves too good to follow his example? We are not too good. And we have been created in Christ Jesus for good works in order that we would walk in them. And some of those good works are in very low places. And so let us do so. Let us serve following the example of our Lord because he is our Lord. And if our Lord has so served us, if he has so loved us, then we also ought to love. We also ought to serve one another. We also ought to love. We also ought to serve others, even those who hate us. Because if I want to grow strong as a follower of Jesus, it will require that I serve. And it will require that I serve after the pattern of the Lord Jesus. Amen? Amen.